Let's talk about optimization and the thing that's called risk pooling. You need to decide on the service level of your organization. If you plan on every single time an order comes in that you fill it, that means you must have safety stock on hand and you have to have it always on hand no matter what. If you want to sit down there and have it most of the time because you have such a high profit margin that maybe you don't need to have it on hand and people are willing to wait for it because you have a unique product, maybe you could throttle it down to 90, maybe 95%, something less. But the reality of it is that you don't want to lose your customers, especially if you're in a competitive market. So you need to decide as an organization what you want your service level to be when an order comes in. How much do you want to have in stock? Because you have to fire up the engines to sit down there and crank it out to manufacture your product. They have it sitting on the shelf. So when somebody orders it, it's a matter of, boom, they have it. And if you're a manufacturer, you may be a manufacturer and then have a distributor and then have the final retailer, whatever that may be, or your model, you need to pay attention to their lead times because of the fact this person, they want it now, 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 now. And by the way, the distributor wants it now, 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 now. And by the way, the manufacturer wants it on the shelf now, now. So everybody's screaming, they want it. And everybody's going to have their own different expectations on their service level. And whatever part you're playing in that role, you need to be able to make certain that you're at 97%, that 97% of the orders that come in are serviced by your company if that's the level that you want. It could be set by the customer or have flexibility to choose their own level of service. So it's a matter of you have this one monster customer. Okay, They may say, oh, I want it 100% of the time nonstop. Well, then you may have to sit down and have a contract with them to sit down and say, okay, we're going to hold no matter what happens, this amount of stock for you at all times. And you have that and you have some type of agreement where you are the sole supplier for them in the process. There are contracts out there like that. That is for your marketing team to sit down there and have their expectations. But also, if that agreement is out there, you need to honor that part. So it could be the customer sets it, and that is probably the best way of doing it. But there's a price to be paid for them and for you. Okay, everything else being equal, the higher the service level, the higher the inventory level. And inventory is capital that could be spent someplace else. And everybody wants to reduce inventory. If they have a chance to put the cost of holding inventory on your back, you better believe your customer will do that because they don't want to sit down there and have this product sitting on their shelf. They'd rather have it sit on your shelf and you worry about the holding cost rather than them. So that being said, the longer the lead time, the lower the level of service provided by the facility. So that's an issue. The impact of the service level decreases with the inventory level. Everything hinges on boom, how fast can I get it for my customer? And retail, the higher service levels, you have to pay attention to items like the profit margin. Now, you might make a 10% profit margin, but the item costs $2, okay? Or you have, you have a, a really a high profit margin, you may have a 10% item that sells for $2,000. Gee, you're going to make $200 versus $2.00. Which one do you think you should pay more attention to? So all this aspect over here is going to depend here at the retail, here at the distributor, here at the warehouse, and what other, other people that are in the chain, how much money they're going to make, how much volume and how much variability, and if there's a short lead time, how, how fast can they get it from your doorstep to their doorstep? All four of these, you have to sit down there and figure out into some type of calculation for optimization. So, oh, by the way, we have one over here. Standard deviation, we talked about what that is and how to go about using that. It's a measurement from the average as to what, what the deviation from that average is going to be, then divided by your average demand, and that's called the coefficient of your variation in the process. We use that as measures variability based upon average demand. We'll talk about this in just a minute as to how to apply that. So risk pooling suggests that demand variability reduces if you aggregate demand across locations. The more locations, okay, the risk pooling, the, the better off you can be. And the book gives you an illustration about the idea of going from two different distribution points to one as to what the difference is gonna be between them. So that being said, you wanna sit down there and have that aspect of it and look in, on the standard deviation and the measure of how that demand tends to be vary around the average.
Here is your coefficient of variation, your standard deviation divided by average demand. The customer measures that variability. The coefficient does that as well. And then you have your three critical points regarding risk pooling. One, centralizing inventory reduces safety stock. Okay, and that's a big savings because you want to reduce your inventory and the average inventory of the system. And then the higher the coefficient, the variation, the greater the benefit from risk pooling. That's why that number, this one over here, is a big thing. That number will help you make a decision as to whether or not you should really reduce the number of distribution points. The benefit of risk pooling depends on the behavior of the demand from one market to demand of another. You may, have, you may be in two different markets, one over here and over here. You're going to have different demands based upon the demography and the customer clients that they're going to be servicing between the two different ones. If you have it together rather than two separate entities, it'll help. Now, the advantage of the two separate entities is more decentralized, and then you'll have the aspect of you'll be able to deliver faster, and then if this one runs out, you might be able to extend the delivery routes of the drivers from this facility over here, and you might have an overall better efficiency, but these are all numbers that can be calculated really well by, by, your, by, your, by your computer, as well as people that specialize in this aspect of it. So your safety stock decreases as the firm moves to a more or less distributed system. Okay, Your service level hopefully will stay the same, if not improve. And then overall, your overhead costs are greater in a distributed system because there's fewer economies of scale. The bigger you have in centralization, the more, the, the more you really reduce your overhead costs and you have better safety stock. Transportation costs is a big thing. And you want to make certain that you're, nobody else can beat you to it and your customer lead times. And sometimes you have to deal with what we call the serial supply chain because of the fact you'll have different stages over here. And, and the, here's an illustration of an industry we haven't talked about, farming, crop planting, crop maintenance, crop harvesting, transportation, processing biorefining. How many passes does the farmer have to make over to things? Do you have to plant the crop? Okay, then do they have to go over to crop on top of that? Do they have to sit down and fertilize it? And then do they have to weed? Do they have to then re-fertilize it and then go through crop harvesting? How many passes over there? I had a detailed discussion once with a farmer, a professional farmer that had 2,000 acres of land. He was really serious about it, spent his life in the cab of a tractor, listening to music all the time. And the only time he dealt with this tractor was when it finished one long row. And then he had to worry about well, the, the, the tractor was self-propelled, guided itself until it came to the ends. He handled the ends. So he was in the tractor all day long, they went from seven passes over the field per harvest down to four. He reduced his overall time and improved the quality of the plant by having better crop maintenance. Uh, that saved him money, saved him time, and he got more yield on that. So each plan is just like that. The, in the echelon inventory stage, you're going to have people in that line by different aspects of it, just like he did as an individual. You'll have people all out there. So the reorder point for distributor, here's your formula for that. Okay, a similar approach you use to manage the inventory at the wholesaler and the manufacturer for each lead time. So optimization and risk pooling. Okay, when you each segment of an echelon, we call the echelon the in, the, the the individual different status. Okay, they all have their own lead time, their own safety stock, their own transportation costs, and so on. And each segment has its own decision makers that are going to use data from their organization to make decisions as to what they're looking at and the level of service and the lead time and their own safety stock. And of course, they all want you to carry as much as you can because they want to save their costs as well. Optimization and risk pooling. Take care.